Welcome to John Gibbs Games. This is my variety vlog for September 2018, and as you can see, I'm going to be covering several different things in this video, so feel free to skip ahead to the part that most interests you, or stick around for the whole thing. Let's go ahead and start off with general updates, and the first thing, as always, will be a very brief Patreon campaign update. Uh, now, I mentioned before that the last couple months have been pretty negative overall with the uh, totals, but this month was essentially even, with just a negative $1 for the overall support. Uh, there were 8 new people who pledged support to the campaign, which I really appreciate. Uh, unfortunately, there were 15 people who uh, removed their uh, pledges, but, you know, these things ebb and flow, and overall, it was really great to see that um, it essentially stayed uh, even <laughs> throughout that month, and hopefully, maybe next month, it can go a little bit positive. Either way, I really appreciate all of the support that everybody has been giving, uh, and let's now go ahead and move into the next update, which is uh, arguably the biggest of these general updates, and that is uh, a very exciting turn that's happened for me, uh, and that is the fact that I'm now doing a little bit of board game development. Uh, I mentioned a few months ago that one of the reasons I just wanted to stop making reviews for the channel is that I wanted to uh, focus that critical uh, energy towards making board games better while they uh, before they're actually published. And uh, at this point, I have now started working with Navu Games. Uh, they're the people who came out with uh, The Reckoners, uh, Crosstalk, as well as Stockpile. And they reached out to me after hearing that I'm interested in doing professional development work. And I have now um, already started that off. <laughs> uh, I've already done a bit of work uh, on one of the games that they're hoping to publish next year. And I might be working with them on some of their other titles. So I am very very excited about this. It's been honestly really fun so far. Uh, instead of uh, talking to a camera, giving my uh, critical opinion on a published game, I'm writing uh, these large documents with just all of these different thoughts that I have for ways that uh, these games can be tweaked and different uh, ideas I have. And uh, so far, it's uh, been a very enjoyable experience for me. And I'm looking forward to working with them more and also the potential of uh, in the future working with other developers while also continuing to make the uh, playthrough and vlog style content um, that you're used to on John its games. Okay, uh, the last of the updates is uh, actually not really a, an update. It's more of a uh, something I'd like to just mention, and that is that I've noticed over time that my playthrough videos have been getting longer. Uh, it seems like uh, every time I sit down to edit one of these videos, I just start to hold my breath as I'm cutting out all of the stuff to see what the ending uh, time is going to be. And more often than not, it ends up being longer than I like. You know, I'll, I'll get to the point and I'll be like, oh my gosh, this is another video that's going to be more than two hours long. I remember back when I made the first video that was over two hours long, and I thought that was ridiculously epic, and now it seems like the average length of my playthroughs is between an hour and a half and two hours, and I somewhat often go over that two hour mark. Now, every time I do this, I get this little uh, pit in my stomach, like, um, you know, this is just, this isn't what people want, it's just too long, it's gonna turn people off, but then I publish a video, and nobody ever complains about the videos being too long. So the reason I'm mentioning this is really just to kind of put it out there in the ether. I'm just kind of curious, like, because nobody's complaining, does that mean that people are okay with having some of these playthroughs be the length of large feature-length movies, you know? Uh, two hours to watch a board game is a significant amount of time, and I know that most people, I can look at the graphs, <laughs> most people don't watch the whole thing, uh, and you can get the idea for how 90% um, of a game works usually within the first 20 minutes of even the two and a half hour long uh, playthroughs, but overall I've been trying a little bit to uh, reduce the length of these videos overall without um, getting rid of the quality and the, the introspection and the thoughts that I put into them. But at the same time, I'm wondering if it isn't broken, maybe I shouldn't try to fix it. So yeah, I'm kind of just throwing that out there, um, talking about it, and now I'd love to hear uh, your opinion. So uh, with that, we've now come to the end of the updates, and we can now move into my upcoming schedule. Uh, now, if we look forward to the next four weeks, it looks like um, in week 39, I'm going to be putting out a playthrough for uh, Teotihuacan. Uh, this one was uh, voted on by my Patreon supporters. Everyone who uh, pledges $5 a month or more gets to vote on these things every month. And this one won by a somewhat large margin. Um, I'm going to start filming that one uh, probably today after I finish uh, recording this vlog. I expect that one will take a few days to do, and then I'm publishing it next week, which will be week 39. Um, in week 40, I'm tentatively planning on putting out a video for Atlantis Rising, which is a um, reprint, I believe, of a board game that came out a while ago. Uh, it's supposedly hitting Kickstarter, I think, that week, so um, I believe we're still on track to have that happen. And then I'll also be doing my impressions vlog um, in week 40, covering a whole 
whole bunch of games that I've been playing recently. Uh, in week 41, I'm planning on putting out a playthrough for Monumental. Uh, now, that is the week that the re-release of that Kickstarter is going to happen. Uh, they reached out to me a few weeks ago and asked me if I was interested in covering it, and I said, yeah, it looks like a pretty interesting take on um, uh, deck building as well as uh, civilization-style building areas. Uh, the game looks Somewhat interesting, so I'm looking forward to uh, uh, making that video. Uh, and then in week 42, I'm uh, planning on doing a full playthrough for Tidal Blades. Now, this is another game coming out from uh, Druid City Games, and I've made a few videos for them in the past. Um, the game looks gorgeous overall so far. I haven't seen a copy of it just yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to uh, trying that one out for sure, and I'm publishing that playthrough in week 42, and then I should also be uh, publishing the next variety vlog in that week as well. So, um, as always, this uh, schedule might change a little bit, and I might end up adding uh, a playthrough in uh, here or there, uh, depending on how my schedule uh, uh, actually ends up going when I get through these weeks. But this this should give you a reasonable idea of what I'm looking for, uh, what, in, what I'm looking to put out in the next month. All right, let's now move into the next segment, which involves questions and answers. I only have one that I'll be covering this month, and if you have questions you'd like me to answer in future months, then uh, please send those over to jongetsgames at gmail.com. All right, let's now move into this question, and it was sent to me by Matthias. Uh, and they said that uh, you've mentioned a few times that engine building is your favorite mechanic. Can you tell us what game made you discover and or fall in love with this particular mechanic? And also, what's the first uh, slash oldest game you'd say that has a proper engine building mechanic in it? Now, I did a good bit of thinking about this one from a personal perspective, and I do think the first engine builder that I bumped into, especially one that made me fall in love with it, is going to be Through the Ages. Um, now, this is the original through the ages that came out back in 2006. Um, I played this one in probably 2008 for the first time. It was, uh, I played this one before I actually uh, found the wider world of board games. I went from uh, Settlers of Catan to Stone Age to Through the Ages. And the reason for that is because I found Board Game Geek and at that point, Through the Ages was, I believe, the number one game or maybe Twilight Struggle was. Either way, it was one of the top uh, board games um, on the overall ranking. So I decided to get a copy of it. Um, actually, specifically, I convinced one of my friends to buy a copy of it, and then we played his copy, and I fell in love with it immediately. Um, it was a three-player game, and uh, my friend, uh, both of my friends around the table were also sitting with me, and we didn't technically finish a whole game. We played, I think, just one out of the three ages of the game, and it took us like four hours because we were reading the rules as we were going, and none of us had any context for this type of game at all, and they were totally burned out by it, and I just could see what was going on, and I was just in, in, instantly fascinated. Uh, it would be a couple of years before I really got into the game and ended up playing it, um, you know, about 30 times now, if you consider the uh, plays that I've had for the new version as well. And um, in that game, you are starting off with not much, and you are drafting a whole bunch of cards that get put out into your tableau that generate your engine. Um, engine building is a, as a mechanic, is something that you could say uh, could go in a bunch of different ways. But in general, the idea is you don't have much, and as you go through the game, you create systems that generate stuff for you, then you can use that stuff to create more systems that will generate more stuff. And in Through the Ages, that involves um, making uh, the ability to get more food and the ability to get more ore and you could use ore to get better um, civic buildings which will get you science in which you can also do a variety of other things. Um, so you have this big amazing thing that's spewing out all sorts of points and resources at the end of a game. And lots of uh, engine building games have that. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to your second question about what do I think is the oldest slash first game that does this, uh, I imagine that could be a very big research project. So I looked into it a little bit and I've decided I'm just going to stick with the same answer. Uh, Through the Ages is uh, the oldest one that I can currently think of. Uh, it did come out in 2006 and I've played many games since then that um, seem to borrow off of a lot of the ideas that Through the Ages came out with. And I was not uh, following modern board games in 2006 when this came out. It was, like I said, about 2008 or 9 when I actually got to experience it. So I'm not sure just how revolutionary it was when it very first hit the market, but to me it does seem like um, it, this is one of the earlier games that really brought together this uh, start with nothing and build up a huge awesome engine thing. Um, and I'm sure there are other examples, and if you know one and you're yelling at the screen that I'm totally wrong, then uh, please uh, write a comment down below and I would love to uh, learn a little bit more about the history of uh, engine building because I might follow a lot of board games and I might be obsessed with board games, but I don't have an academic um, uh, knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge of the games, especially the ones that came out long before I got into the hobby. 
Okay, that's going to pretty much wrap that one up. If you have any questions you'd like me to answer in a future month, then again, please shoot that over to johngetsgames at gmail.com, and I will add it onto the list. Let's now move into the next segment, and that one is going to be the Shifting Shelf. Now, this is where I talk about all of the new games that I acquired uh, over the last month, and I also talk about the games that I have removed from my collection to try and make room for the new stuff that's coming in. Now, it looks like I acquired only five games over this last month, which is less than uh, I would normally expect, and I think uh, with some of the big conventions uh, coming up soon with, like, Essen and whatnot, there's going to be a lot of new titles, so I imagine I'll have bigger months coming. But uh, anyway, in alphabetical order, the first one I got is Detective. Uh, this one comes out from Portal Games, and they sent me a, uh, a media copy, and that showed up just a couple days ago. I believe it's still in the shrink, rack, shrink wrap, so I haven't had a chance to really uh, poke into that one too much yet, but I do know that it's a bit of a uh, sleuthing, uh, cooperative game where everybody tries to um, figure out um, what actually happened, and you can use the internet and Wikipedia, and I think it's got a whole bunch of wacky ideas, and I'm looking forward to trying that one. Uh, I also got a copy of Fertility uh, yesterday, and I actually played it yesterday as well. Uh, this is uh, a game that is, I believe, designed by the same person who made Sapiens. Uh, so it's uh, this one is also a domino-style game where you put these um, these double square pieces out on a board, you match things up kind of like dominoes, and you get resources, and you spend those resources to get victory points in a variety of different ways. Um, I will talk about my first impressions on that one in the next impressions vlog because I have had a chance to play that one already. Um, the third game uh, that I got is Isle of Sky, uh, the Journeyman Expansion. Uh, so I guess not technically a game by itself, but I picked this one up at a local game store that I had some store credit in, and I love Isle of Sky. It's one of my favorite games ever. Um, well, my favorite game so far. Uh, definitely a top 10 game at this point. And um, in general, I'm not super crazy about getting expansions for games, but since I had store credit, I decided to grab it. And I did get to play that one last night as well, so I will discuss my feelings on that one in the next uh, Impressions Vlog. The third game that I got is Polis. Uh, now, this was an early copy that was sent to me uh, by the publisher, uh, an early English copy, that is. Uh, it came out in Polish and Dutch, I think, last year. And I actually talked about my impressions of this one already in the uh, prior impressions vlog. So if you're curious about that one, definitely check out the last vlog that I put out because I talked about this one quite a bit. And the uh, fifth game that I got is uh, the full uh, released copy of Teotihuacan. Now, I mentioned um, before in this video that I'm going to be doing a full playthrough video of that one. I have also played that one with friends, so I will be discussing my thoughts on that one in the next Impressions vlog as well. So I've been doing a pretty good job of playing the games as they've been coming in this month. Uh, now, when it comes to the games that are going away, uh, I decided to pull three off the shelf. Uh, the first one is Carthago. That one came out last year at uh, Spiel, and then uh, Capstone Games put out a U.S. version of it. I did a sponsored playthrough for it, and it's got multi-use cards in a very tight Euro package. Um, if you're interested in learning how that one plays, then please check out my playthrough. Um, I just never found myself actually coming back to it. Um, with so many other games coming out right now, uh, this one just sat on my shelf for quite a while. So I figure it's probably uh, it's probably going to make more sense for to have this one uh, go onto somebody else's shelf where it might actually get a little bit more love. Uh, the second game is, that I pulled off is Honshu. Now I removed this from my collection for two reasons. Um, uh, to have a little bit of context, Honshu is a, um, a card game where you do a little bit of trick taking and then you take these cards that are cut into six different chunks and you play them out in front of yourself in a tableau building kind of uh, tiling type of thing to match terrain and get victory points for doing a variety of things. Now I did a full review of this one so you can see my extended thoughts on that one, but um, reason number one I got rid of it is because Carson City the Card Game just came out and I got a copy of it. I've played it twice now and I really like it and I think it's just better than Honshu in every way. Uh, and the other reason is uh, something I'm going to talk about very soon, and that is that there's kind of a sequel to Honshu coming out at Spiel uh, very soon, uh, and I think that one might use card drafting instead of trick-taking for the tableau building. So uh, I think out with the old, and hopefully, hypothetically, in with the new, especially with Carson City, the card game which I already have, and, you know, maybe the other one which I might be able to pick up a, a copy of. Uh, that one's called Hokkaido, I believe, and again, I'll, I'll be talking about that in just a minute. Okay, the uh, third game that I removed is Quacksalber uh, von Quinlenburg, uh, or I think the Quacks of Quinlenburg, which is going to be the English uh, title for that one. Uh, I bought a German copy of this several months ago. Um, I bought it because it was nominated for the uh, Kennerspiel. Yes, yeah, the Kennerspiel. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's nominated for this award. I should probably get a copy and try to cover it. Uh, so I did get a copy. I had to put English paste-ups for the uh, translating from German. I made a full playthrough of it, which you can watch to see um, how it works. But ultimately, Ultimately, 
Uh, this one kind of left me a little bit flat. And honestly, I played this one like seven times. So I played it a lot. And I found the last couple times I played it, it's been really disappointing me. Um, it seems like when this game goes right, when it works, it is super fun. Uh, because the, you are pushing your luck as you're back building and pulling tokens out and you're trying not to bust. But when this game goes wrong, it is super not fun. And uh, in the last time I played this one, I just had the worst luck ever. Like I wasn't even pushing my luck. I just kept pulling out all the bad tokens and none of the good tokens. I lost by a huge margin, and I really don't think it was because I played wrong. I just had really bum luck, and I had an actively unfun time, and I said, you know what? I don't think I want to play this game again. I think I'm over it, so I'm going to be uh, getting rid of that copy, and a lot of people really do like this. It won the Kennerspiel Award, so obviously a lot of people see a lot of great stuff in here, and it is a good package. I just I didn't like, I didn't think the lows that it gave me were worth the highs that it could, uh, but for some other people, it certainly will. So yeah, that's going to wrap up the shifting shelf for this month. And this means that we can now move into the final segment of this video, which is going to be a doozy because this is the new subscriptions, uh, which technically means these are all the games that I clicked subscribe to on BoardGameGeek over this last month. Now, whenever you're subscribed to a game on that uh, website, you're going to get any uh, new forum posts, file posts, or uh, new videos that pop up. So essentially, these are games that I want to learn more about, and I'm going to now briefly try to run through all 27 that popped up. It's definitely a big month, and a big part of that has to do with... Um, the Essen Spiel convention coming up pretty soon, and so lots of games are getting announced. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump right into it. I'll get my laptop out here and uh, probably not be looking at the camera as much as normal. Uh, the first game that I'll be covering is, uh, well, <laughs> that I subscribe to, is A Column of Fire. Uh, now, this one is a sequel to The Pillars of the Earth and World Without End. Uh, they are apparently novels, but also there are board games made for all of them. And this came out in uh, 2017, I think, at uh, Essen Spiel last year. And the reason I'm interested in this one is because I watched uh, Rado's run-through of this. It came out just a few weeks ago, and I watched a little bit, and it had some really cool ideas. You roll your dice, and then you use those dice to do a variety of things. Uh, but the main thing you do is you use a die, like it says, like a three on it, to go to a spot and draft a uh, card, which gives you a ability you can keep using. And you use that three, and you put it on the card, and then you get that card for three rounds. So if you use a six, then you get access to a card for six rounds, but then you don't get to roll that die on subsequent rounds. So you could build a big engine out of all these cards and then not be able to roll very many dice and not have many options, but you have a bunch of these other cards that are just ticking away. Now there's a bunch of other things going on for this one, and uh, I'm definitely interested in trying this out. It looked like a pretty neat experience. Maybe I'll uh, try to hunt this one down at Board Game Geek Con uh, this year. Uh, it looks like this one is designed by Michael Reinick, and I looked it up and it looks like he's designed the other ones in the series, as well as uh, Cuba, and he was one of the designers uh, with Stefan Feld for Merlin, so definitely an experienced designer there. All right, uh, the next game is A Pleasant Journey to Neko. Now, uh, this one is being published by The Wood Games, and the designer is City Low. Now, it doesn't look like that designer has anything else on uh, Board Game Geek at the moment. And the reason this game jumped out to me is, well, it has a cute cover of a captain and a bunch of penguins. And it, this looks like it's a uh, dice placement slash manipulation Euro style game where you are trying to build an expedition to go and uh, see a bunch of penguins. I think penguins are uh, the main uh, victory point scoring thing in this game. Uh, there are some pretty interesting images up on Board Game Geek right now that show um, cards with a whole bunch of variety on them. And it looks like you maybe sailboat between the cards and the way the cards are adjacent to each other kind of makes a route. I don't know a whole lot more than that, but I'm definitely interested in learning more about that. The uh, next game moving on is going to be Bastille. Now, this one is designed by Christoph Baer, uh, and it looks like um, he has uh, designed a few things, but I haven't don't recognize any of them, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> so uh, this game is uh, it's set in the French Revolution. Obviously, Bastille is the uh, the famous prison that was uh, broken out of uh, as part of that revolution. And um, what's going on in this game is it looks like you have various influence tokens, and when it's your turn, you place them on different spots on the board, and once everybody's put all their tokens down, you evaluate each zone based off of how much influence you put into that spot. Uh, it looks like it's a medium-ish weight, maybe slight to, uh, light to medium weight uh, euro, which is the the kind of thing that I just love. Uh, it's being uh, published by Queen Games, and I perused the rules, and I remember thinking, that looks neat. I want to try that out, and so uh, that's why I subscribed to that one. Uh, moving on, we now have Carpe Diem. 
Now, this one is designed by Stefan Feld. Uh, he's actually uh, has a couple games coming out uh, this year, um, and both of them have to do with um, uh, ancient Rome, and this is the first one. Uh, so this is a Thailand game, and I know that um, Castles of Burgundy was, you know, technically a Thailand game that Stefan Feld has done in the past, but this one is is very much a Thailand game in the, the trope where you take tiles with different edges and you put them down in an area in front of you, and the edges are going to have to match up with other edges and you're building... Um, markets and you're uh, making buildings and you're doing a variety of different things and then uh, at the end of each round and there's four rounds you're going to score for a variety of different um, uh, uh, scoring opportunities. Now this probably sounds like the dullest thing in the world because I've uh, just kind of glossed over a lot of it. Uh, the reason I'm excited about this game is because the way you pick these tiles uses this seven pointed star that uh, restricts your movement to actually grab them and the way that the scoring actually works is going to be hard to describe right now just on screen but take my word for it uh, look this one up if you're interested in stuff on Phil because it looks uh, pretty interesting and I, I think it's not going to be as familiar to his other games as um, you might expect because you really only get points it looks like for matching the scoring conditions as opposed to getting points for everything like many stuff on Fell games do. So yeah this one's being published by Elia and I'm actively interested in trying this one out. Uh, we can now move on to Castle Rampage. Now, this one is uh, this one was designed by Matthias Kramer, which is honestly the only reason I've subscribed to it. It's a two-player game that says 15-minute playtime. It looks like you are um, drawing cards and you're playing cards in front of yourself to defend yourself and then playing other cards in order to attack your one opponent. It says it's kind of a tower defense two-player game, plays in 15 minutes. I think Matthias Kramer makes some really good games, so that's the main reason I'm curious to learn a little bit more about this one. I don't think the rules are out for it just yet, and I don't really play two-player games all that often. But yeah, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about it, and it's being published by Pegasus Spiel, it looks like. Okay, the next game is going to be Ceylon. I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. This one is being published by Ludo Nova, and uh, the designers are Chris and Suzanne Zinsley. And it looks like they have, uh, they designed Tessin and Cobras and Dubai, which are three games that I've vaguely heard of before. But either way, um, this is a, looks like medium-ish weight Euro game of uh, tea farming in Sri Lanka 600 years ago. Uh, so that's definitely a different uh, theme than I'm used to bumping into. And uh, from a mechanical perspective, I like what I've seen so far because it looks like it is a play a card Euro, uh, which is one of my favorite kinds of Euros where when it's your turn, you just play a card and that's your whole turn. And this one, every card has uh, two actions on it. And when you play the card, you do it this way or that way. And uh, you, as the person who's playing a turn, you get to activate one side and everybody else gets to activate the other side. And you get to choose which side they take. And you are moving a person around and planting tea fields and harvesting tea and getting contracts and all that kind of uh, euro stuff. But yeah, it looks um, beautiful on the images. There's lots of images on Board Game Geek of this one so far. So I'm uh, very interested in trying this one out. Okay, let's now move on to City of Rome. Uh, now, this one, and uh, the only reason I subscribe to this game is because it's designed by uh, Matthew Dunstan and Brett Gilbert. Uh, they have designed uh, many games, uh, one of them being Elysium, which I actually didn't like very much, but I respected the design. I just didn't think it was uh, my kind of game. Uh, so because of that, I definitely want to pay a little bit of attention to the other stuff that they do. Uh, Fairy Tile they made, which I thought was pretty great. Um, and I've heard good things about Costa Rica. They've designed quite a few games. There's uh, several pages on Board Game Geek. But either way, when it comes back to the city of Rome, that's really the only thing I know about this game. Uh, there are no images up just yet, and the description says uh, you're rebuilding uh, the Rome. You're rebuilding Rome, and the most talented builder of antiquity is going to win. Um, you have to be smart in order to cleverly exert your influence, and then you win if you're the best. I mean, it really doesn't say much more than that. The mecha mechanisms says pattern building, and I like patterns. So yeah, um, going off of uh, the back of that, I'm curious to learn more about this one. It's coming out from public. Sure, Abaca Spiel, and uh, definitely sub subscribe to this one because there is nothing uh, really on there just yet. So uh, let's now move on to fertility. Uh, well, I've already talked about this one in the Shifting Shelf segment, so I think I'm just going to move right on past this. I, I got a copy, and I'll talk about my uh, impressions on that one soon, um, but I subscribed to it before I even knew I was going to be getting a copy, because it looks like it, um, well, I know it's a uh, uh, cute little um, uh, domino uh, stacking game, but I've talked about this one already, so uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next game, which is Franchise. Now, this one is uh, published by Queen Games, uh, and it looks like this is a uh, re-implementation of a game called Medieval Merchant. Now, I never played Medieval Merchant, but I, I remember seeing an image of the board, and it looks so busy with all these little nodes and routes going all over the place. 
and this re-implementation uh, brings it to the United States in I think like the 1950s or so thematically wise and you again have a bunch of nodes and roads and paths going all over the place but this looks like it's a light to medium weight euro where um, you are building franchises out and it has kind of a push and pull where um, if you're the only person in a city you get lots of income but the more people and the more franchises that crowd in the less income you get including yourself if you put more of your own stuff into a city then you will make less money but if you have a majority of your franchises in a city then you can score it and get more points so um, I like seeing that kind of tension in lightweight euro games and uh, so I'm curious to try this one out uh, Ooh, also the artist for this one is Ian O'Toole who has made some very good looking games in the past okay let's now move on to fruit friends so uh, this one was, uh, it's coming out by a com uh, publisher, Comet. Uh, I only know about this game because uh, W. Eric Martin did a quick little overview video of it, and it looks like a cute um, 20 or so minute I Split You Choose set collection style game where every single turn you get seven cards in your hand when it's your turn, and you uh, discard one, and then make three uh, face-up piles of two, and then two of your opponents choose two of those piles, and then you get the third pile, and you get um, set collection type bonuses for having different types of fruit. It looks cute, and um, because of that, I'm interested in learning more. I have always found the uh, I Split You Choose mechanism to be somewhat compelling. So, yeah, I think that one's worth uh, checking out and uh, maybe trying to get a copy of. All right, let's now move on to the next game, which is going to be Fuji. Now, the main reason I subscribe to this one is because the designer is Wolfgang Worsch, who designed uh, Die Quacksalber von Quinlenberg, uh, Ganschen Clever, and The Mind. So he's definitely come out with a bang so far in 2018. And uh, even though I decided I'm getting rid of Quacksalber, I still think that uh, uh, Wolfgang Worsch has some really good ideas. And uh, this one is a cooperative dice game where you're all trying to run away from Mount Fuji, which is, I guess, erupting. And it looks like the main mechanics in this game involve you roll your dice and you hide them from your uh, partners around the table and then you decide to do a bunch of things then you reveal your shields and see if you're able to do it based off of the dice that you rolled like if my dice are higher than your dice then I can do with I can go next to you but if my dice are if your dice are higher than mine then I can't and you have a small amount of information that you can give away so it's one of those uh, low information partnership uh, cooperative style games and uh, I don't know much more about it but um, Having it be a uh, Wolfgang Warsh and a uh, strange hidden dice mechanism is enough for me to want to learn a little bit more about it. Okay, we can now move on to Gobi. Uh, this one is uh, designed by, it looks like, Sean Graham and Scott Huntington. Um, those names don't look too familiar to me, but it looks like uh, they have designed several games together like uh, Atlandice and Jolly and Roger. Either way, uh, the reason I subscribe to this game is because, well, honestly, it has a beautiful cover. Uh, they say uh, don't judge a book by its cover, don't judge a game by its cover, but, you know, if it's pretty, then it's definitely going to um, make me want to uh, take a look at it again and maybe look a little bit deeper. Now, this looks like, um, after looking into it a little bit more, a pretty lightweight tiling game where you have a communal tiling area where you are kind of building out the Gobi Desert, and when you place a tile, you put little camels down, and you're trying to connect your camel from one tribe to another. Uh, I'm not super sold on it, if I'm being honest, but um, overall the aesthetic of it and the uh, light tile placing nature of it is enough for me to want to learn a little bit more from it. Uh, it looks like the publisher on this one is Capsicum Games. Okay, let's now go on to Hokkaido. So I kind of teased talking about this one earlier because this one is officially a sequel to Honshu. It's got the same art style, um, does it have the same designer? I'm going to check it up real quick here. It looks like it does. Yes. Uh, so it's the same designer and same art style from the same publisher, um, Lauta Pelletti. I'm sure I butchered that publisher's name, but either way, this one looks like, just like Honshu, it's a tiling game with cards where you are building out uh, beautiful landscapes in front of yourself. But there's very little uh, information on Board Game Geek besides the cover to the game. Um, it really just says um, that Hokkaido is the second map building game in the Nippon series, bringing new ideas and mechanisms to the first design, Honshu. Now, as I mentioned before, I liked a lot about Honshu and I disliked um, a significant number about, about Honshu as well. So if this is similar but different, then it's definitely something I want to take a look at. And in the categories and mechanisms, it mentions um, card drafting and hand management. So I definitely like those two things. All right, uh, we can now move on. And it looks like uh, the next game is Magna Storm. Now this one is coming out by uh, Foyland Spiel and the designer is Baldrick and Friends. Uh, it looks like the only other game they have listed is Power Struggle and Board Game Geek, which I'm not familiar with. 
Um, either way, the reason I subscribe to this one is uh, because, uh, well, I think Foyland Spiel can put out some uh, pretty interesting games, and this one looks like it is a medium, if not maybe slightly heavyweight uh, Euro game uh, with a very little, a very low amount of luck, where you are trying to kind of gain influence on this new storm that you, uh, <laughs> this new planet that you are landing on that I guess has magna storms on it, and um, the the main um, uh, tension and mechanic in this game appears to be when it's your turn, you can choose option A or option B. If you choose option a, it makes option B cheaper. Uh, or if you use option A, it makes option A uh, uh, cheaper for other people. That's right. So if you keep doing it, then you're incentivizing other people to do it. And option B, I think, also interacts with option A. Um, there's not a ton of information about this one just yet. There's a lot of text in the description, but it didn't super make a lot of sense to me without seeing a nice version of the map. But either way, uh, that is definitely enough for me to uh, try to learn more about it. Um, we can now move on. And it looks like we have my story. Now, this one came out last year, um, I think at um, um, Essen 2017. I vaguely remember hearing about it. Um, and this one is now um, uh, subscribed for me on Board Game Geek again because of Rado. Uh, he put out a uh, full uh, he put out a run through of this one uh, a couple weeks ago. And the more I watch this one, the more intrigued I was by it. Uh, it's a deck building game, but the I, the thematic idea of this game is you are playing out through your whole life. Like you start out as I think a teenager, and the game ends when you retire at the ripe old age of fifty five. I think, which is a nice thought, <laughs> but. Um, it looks like this has some pretty neat ideas from a thematic uh, twist to bring in like um, having different jobs and having the different people, uh, the different cards in your deck being like friends who can interact with your job in a variety of different ways. Uh, it just looked like it had some pretty cool ideas. And so this one is definitely one I would like to keep my eye on and potentially uh, try to track down a copy maybe at Board Game Geek uh, Con to, uh, to give a shot. All right, we can now move on to the next game, which is Realm of Sand. Now, um, I just bumped into this one earlier today uh, because I saw that uh, Suzanne Sheldon uh, posted photos of it on Twitter, and I was like, wow, that is a really good-looking game. Wait a second, that game looks really familiar. And then I realized that I played a prototype of this game back at uh, Gamma in March earlier this year. Um, at that point, it didn't have a title and it didn't really have a theme, but um, it had a bunch of Legos that we used to put things together. And uh, so it looks like they've now uh, come up with a beautiful theme and title, honestly. Realm of Sand is nice and the imagery is great as you are trying to um, essentially build out um, this pattern building in front of yourself. Now, I joked at Gamma when I played the prototype of this that it should be called Splatchwork because it was kind of like a mixture of Splendor and Patchwork. Um, you have a Splendor-like card row in the middle uh, where you are trying to uh, match up with uh, different conditions, um, very similar to Splendor. Uh, and then you also have a Patchwork type thing with a big ring of these different uh, three um, colored pieces in different shapes. And you are going to be using these to try and put tokens down in front of you and then match those uh, shapes to the cards that are in the middle of the table. And when you do that, you take the card and you've effectively built that building, but then you remove the tokens from your board. Uh, so it, we were trying to figure out a good theme for it uh, back in March, and it looks like they ended up with sand. You know, sand shifts around, so it looks like things come and they go in this realm of sand. So uh, yeah, I subscribed to this one because um, I definitely want to keep my eye on it. I really enjoyed the prototype, and glancing through the information out here, it looks like it's largely the same game, uh, but they have done made some tweaks, which are probably for the better. But either way, uh, that one's coming out by uh, Emperor S4. And it looks like the designer is Ji Huawei, which I'm sure that's not how you pronounce his name, unfortunately, but uh, he uh, has only uh, he has only this game in Board Game Geek right now. Uh, so let's now move on to the next game. And this one is Rayholt. Now, this one is uh, was designed by Uwe Rosenberg, and it's being published by, it looks like, Frosted Games and Renegade Games and a bunch of other publishers as well. Um, Uwe Rosenberg is obviously one of the more renowned uh, board game designers out there, so that was enough reason for me to click the subscribe button on this one. Uh, when I looked into it a little bit more before filming, it looks like you have some pretty standard worker placement type uh, stuff going on here. Uh, it's set in Iceland, but then um, you potentially have a bit of a, a story that you might go through, like chapter-based from game to game, um, and it looks like there's also a couple of other things going on. It's a little bit um, hard to tell at the moment. They did post the rules, and I skimmed through them, but I didn't really have the time to uh, rake through them entirely to see all of the different um, things that are going on there. Uh, either way, a new Uwe, Uwe Rosenberg that, a game that's a light to medium weight Euro is something that I want to pay attention to, so I subscribe to that one. All right. Uh, next up, we have Rolling Ranch. Uh, now, this one is uh, being published by Thundergriff Games, and the designer is Jordi Aiden. Uh, when I look in Board Game Geek, it looks like he's designed a game called Doodle Realms, and that's the only other one. 
and this is a roll and write style game, and it looks like you are a farmer, and um, your farm, I guess, got taken out by a hurricane, and so you're trying to rebuild your farm and uh, breed your pigs uh, and get some chickens and get some cows and do all that kind of uh, farmy stuff. Um, but as a roll and write game, it's one where you roll two dice, and then um, everybody uh, evaluates those two dice at the same time, so you're all working off the same set, and you can do three different things with those dice uh, in a variety of different combinations. And I have been uh, somewhat enamored by roll and write games over the last couple of years, it looks like a lot of people have been in the overall industry. And so this is another one. Uh, it's a small box, um, and it looks like it might be cute. It might have some neat ideas. So I want to pay a little bit of uh, attention over to that one. All right, next up, it looks like we have Sailblazer. Uh, this one is being published by Korea Board Games um, Co. Limited, and the designer is Bonghua Jun. Again, I apologize for the uh, uh, terrible pronunciation of uh, your names. Uh, this is the only game that's currently on uh, Board Game Geek for this designer. And the reason I subscribe to this one, well, part of it had to do with the cover. As I mentioned before, if it has a good cover, then that's going to uh, be enough for me to take a second glance. Uh, it's got like ships crashing, and uh, not crashing into each other, crashing through waves, kind of racing uh, with a person kind of leaning off of a mast. And looking at the description, there's no images really on Board Game Geek right now, but there's a decent description. And it looks like on your turn, you move your ship and then you evaluate the spot that you land on, which um, could involve, uh, I guess, fighting pirates, uh, selling, buying, trading goods, resupplying, working at a port, fishing, just a variety of different things. And uh, that's, I guess, enough for me to be interested in learning a little bit more about it. Um, it might end up not being something that I'm super interested in, but uh, as far as a light to medium-ish uh, weight game, it says three to five players, 60 minutes. Uh, that's enough for me to want to know a little bit more. So yeah, the category is adventure, exploration, and pirates. So I definitely think pirates come into play uh, as a non-player character that you have to deal with. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely want to learn more about that one. There's not a whole lot on Board Game Geek just yet. All right, let's move on to Scientia. Uh, this one, first of all, I'm not sure if that's the way they intended for that to be pronounced. Uh, this one I also subscribed to uh, purely because it had a really stunning uh, box cover. Uh, the artist is Vincent Dutrait, and he does a lot of great board game art for a variety of games. And when I looked at to the details of this game, uh, the mechanisms listed just says set collection. Um, the There's a little bit of uh, text in the description area on Board Game Geek. It sounds like you are acquiring cards from four different scientific fields like physics, chemistry, biology, and astronomy. And you play cards down and you rotate them, and when they fully rotate around, you cash them in, or something like that. I'm not super sure about the actual details of the mechanics on this one, but a beautiful cover, and um, again, light to medium weight, um, simple mechanics is enough for me to want to learn a little bit more. It looks like the designer on this one is Evan Song, and when I look up on Board Game Geek, he has designed a few games, uh, Rising 5, Fantasy Defense, uh, double mission. I haven't heard of really any of these. So either way, we can now uh, move on from that one. It looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more to cover. Uh, okay, so the next game is called Silk Road. Uh, the uh, This one's being published by Lata Paletti um, as well. Uh, the designers on this one is Remo uh, Casandori and Stefano Negro. I don't recognize either of their names. It looks like, oh, Okay, okay. It looks like uh, Remo designed Expo 1906, uh, which I did play a couple of years ago, and uh, I thought it was pretty fine. It was pretty good. I didn't end up covering it on the channel, but it had some pretty cool ideas in there. Um, and a few other games, including Manitoba, which is coming out by DLP Games at Expo this year. I mean, uh, at Spiel this year. But either way, uh, back to Silk Road. Uh, the reason I subscribe to this one is because uh, it's listed as a 30 to 45 minute playtime, and it says three to eight players. So if it's an interesting game that plays in 30 to 40 minutes for eight players, that could be a nice filler style game. And the uh, description of it uh, sums it up pretty well. Looks like you are all simultaneously selecting a card from your hand, then you reveal them, and based off of the cards that you have selected, there will be a draft order where people will actually take cards from players that from the cards that I think that you put out there, and then you either put cards in front of yourself for points, or you hold other cards in your hand for points. It looks like it's probably a pretty lightweight, uh, simultaneous action um, type drafting sort of game, and uh, those are things that I'm oftentimes interested in. So I'm definitely looking forward to learning more about this one. Okay, moving on, we now have Sword Crafters. Uh, this one is coming out by Adam's Apple Games, and the designer is Ryan Lambert, Chris Newman, and Adam Reinberg. 
Um, I don't recognize any of their names. It looks like um, they came up with a game called Truck Off as well. Uh, so uh, relatively new designers, at least as far as Board Game Geek is concerned. And the reason I subscribed to this game is because I saw a Gen Con overview video on Board Game Geek where they were literally holding cardboard swords, like three-dimensional swords that you piece together, um, and you slot these um, little square um, uh, pieces in to make a... Um, I guess a triangular, I'm sorry, a rectangular extruded sword type thing. So you kind of slot, 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 slot in like a Lincoln Log style. And I guess you have an uh, uh, I split you twos type of thing going on where there's a grid of these tiles in the middle of the table and then you cut them like a sword uh, into a couple different chunks and then another piece of person cuts them and then they get cut again and then you draft from those different piles and then the tiles that you take, you just slot into your sword that gets bigger and bigger, and you get victory points for, you know, I think uh, colors on your sword matching up, like the gems and the, the length of your sword and all that kind of stuff. Um, I subscribe to this one mostly because you build an actual sword out of cardboard, so I'm quite interested in learning more about that one. Okay, uh, let's now move on to the Quest for El Dorado, Heroes and Hexes. So this is obviously an expansion for the Quest for El Dorado, and I think it's the first expansion for Quest for El Dorado. Now, I really liked Quest for El Dorado. I need to stop saying Quest for El Dorado. <laughs> I really liked this game uh, when it came out a couple years ago. Uh, this is a uh, deck-building game uh, by Reiner Knizia, and you are running through an actual map as you're kind of crafting your deck together. I played it just about a month or two ago again and really enjoyed it again. This one is a, a really solid game. So they're coming out with an expansion for it, and I think that expansions for deck builders make a lot of sense. It looks like overall what it brings in is new tiles that you can race through uh, that have demon uh, holes in them, or <laughs> what are they called? Uh, it looks like you can get cursed in them. Uh, Oh my gosh, Demon Spaces. Okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> and uh, you can get cursed, which I think is a bad thing, uh, but there's also different ways that I think curses are not necessarily bad. You can go to taverns and hire heroes that can then jump into your deck and then they're more powerful. So just adding more variety to a really good um, backbone of a game is something that I'm actively interested in. Okay, let's now go on to, it looks like, Treasure Island. Now, uh, this game uh, is designed by Mark Paquin, I think is probably not how you pronounce his name. Uh, oh, it's the same designer as Yamatai. Uh, Yamatai was a very good game that I enjoyed. Um, I guess, obviously. Uh, either way, uh, the artist in this game is Vincent Dutre. The publisher is Matigo. And the reason I subscribe to this one is because my friend uh, Efka from the No Pun Included um, YouTube channel has been talking about this game for years. Uh, I think he played a prototype a couple years ago at Spiel and thought it was just amazing. And so at this point, it finally kind of really hit my radar. I decided to subscribe to it. It's coming out at Spiel this year, and my understanding is, I believe it's a one versus many game, where one person is trying to hide on this treasure island, and everybody else is trying to sleuth out where this first person is, and you actually, like, draw on the island with, like, uh, rulers and, um, I think, compasses, and you, like, try to, like, triangulate where this person is. I, I think it might have a bit of uh, deduction kind of going on there. I don't know much more than that beyond uh, my friend Efka's enthusiasm for it, so um, I subscribe to it so that hopefully I can learn a little bit more. Okay, let's now go on to Valparaiso. Uh, this game is designed by Stefan Maltz and Louis Maltz. Um, it looks like, uh, I actually looked this up before, they've designed a few games that I'm familiar with. Um, Edo, uh, Rococo, and it looks like they also did the expansion for Altiplano that's coming out. Um, either way, I haven't actually played Rococo or Edo before, but I've heard good things about them. And this is, it looks like just a solid medium weight uh, Euro game that's coming out uh, from DLP Games. The artist is Michael Menzel, who makes solid board game art for lots of different games. And uh, it looks like the main uh, quirk for this game is it is a programming Euro game, which you don't usually see that often. Oftentimes programming games involve running around a maze or something like that. But in this one, you all simultaneously face down, program all, all of your actions, and then you flip them up and you evaluate them one at a time. And you are allowed to actually change your program up, it looks like, in this game. Uh, but you have to pay a penalty in pesos, which are probably uh, victory points in the game, or maybe they're just a currency that you really want. Um, beyond that, it looks like you're doing lots of Euro-y things as you are acquiring resources, you're moving resources from your ship off to the shore, you're selling the resources, you're fulfilling contracts. Um, it looks like you can get achievements, which are new 
uh, program cards that get added into your hand so that you can then, as the game goes on, um, kind of develop out and have more options available to you. So I always like it when you start with something and end the game with a more powerful set of somethings. <laughs> in particular for a programming game, I think it would be kind of cool to build out more cards into your hand to be able to modify your program differently. So yeah, it looks like that one's a bit of a race, actually. Uh, the game ends, I think, when you hit a certain number of victory points. And I like seeing that in Euro games as well. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. We're almost to the end. Uh, this game is going to be Walking in Burano. Now, uh, this one's coming out by Emperor S4. They publish a lot of games. Uh, the designer is uh, Wei Min Ling, and it looks like they, in Board Game Geek, have a few different games. Uh, Shadows of Kyoto, uh, Mystery of the Temples, Dark Castle. Um, I've heard of a couple of those, but never actually played any of um, this person's games, it looks like. Um, but what's going on in this game is you have a card drafting and set collection style game uh, where you are uh, drafting these uh, tiles, actually, from the middle of the table. Um, they are all these colorful little story uh, stories, as in, like, stories in a house um, uh, in this area, and you are building out all these houses in front of yourself with these colorful buildings, a, a just um, similar to uh, Burano, the city that has is famous for its colorful buildings. Um, it looks like this is a relatively simple game. Uh, the drafting uh, restrictions involve you taking uh, one, two, or three of the tiles, and if you take less tiles, you get more money, um, and there's some other restrictions there as you're trying to build out these um, buildings in front of yourself with um, adjacency restrictions, and I think you get um, victory points because tourists then come in and they want to see the most attractive looking houses, so you are trying to build your houses so that the tourists come over to your area. Uh, that's pretty much all I know about this one uh, at this point, so I would like to learn more, and I think that might be uh, a cute game. I'd like to try it. <sighs> okay, we finally reached the 27th game that I've just uh, run through right here. This one is going to be Walls of York. Now, I bumped into this one today uh, when I believe I got an email from uh, the publisher, uh, Cranio Creations. Um, I looked into this one a good bit more, and I subscribed to it because I really like what I've seen so far. Now, it appears that what this game is, it's like an abstraction of the roll and write style of game into a session, um, to a, a game where you don't actually write anything down. Uh, you start the game off with a, um, a kind of randomized grid of these little squares, and every single round you're going to roll a certain uh, set of dice, and they will tell you how you can lay these little wall pieces down into your own personal area, but everybody has to work off of the same uh, set, and you are kind of effectively drawing walls with these tokens that you're just laying down. Now you're going to keep going round and round until um, one person, well, until everybody has satisfied a specific uh, requirement for the round, and the earlier you satisfy that requirement, the more victory points you get, and that involves usually just encircling, I think, a certain um, number of uh, building types, and then at the end of the round, I guess, thematically, Vikings come in and kind of tear the walls down, and uh, the people who have the most Viking uh, icons in their area are going to take some tokens, and then you do it again, and you do it twice, and then the person who the most points wins. Now, I really like this idea of um, kind of drawing out with these tokens as you're trying to enclose these walls. I think that's a, uh, a an enjoyable thing to do. Also, I enjoy games that have simultaneous actions where everybody is working off the same uh, random input. Randomness is fine, in my opinion, uh, in lots of games, but in particular in games where everybody has to deal with it and where it happens before you actually take actions, and then you work around that. So, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, neat things going on in what looks like to be a um, light to medium weight package, probably more on the light side. Um, it looks like the designer of this one is Emiliano Wentu Venturini. And when I look on Board Game Geek, um, they designed a few games, but I haven't uh, heard of any of them. Karnak, Foundations... Hexeroid. <laughs> Either way, uh, this one looks like a uh, solid game, and I'm uh, looking forward to giving this one a shot. Okay, at this point, we have now finished the list, so I can retire the uh, laptop over there, and we've now come to the end of this vlog. Uh, obviously, I just uh, talked about a ton of different games that are coming out that I'm actively interested in. This is one of the more fun times of the year, as we are um, uh, coming off of Gen Con and ramping into Essen Spiel, because there are so many games getting announced, and uh, they're coming from a variety of different sources, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to um, trying a lot of these and uh, talking about them in future vlogs. So, uh, once again, if you have any questions you'd like me to answer in a future vlog, then please send that over to jongitsgames at gmail.com. And I've talked a lot about this at this point. I think I should probably wrap this one up.
As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.